Well, you take the good with the bad, I guess. Congratulations, Missourians. You're going to be going to the polls this fall, and you will be voting on sports betting. I know. That's right. You don't have to come to Kansas to place your bets and then go back to Missouri to smoke your weed. Yeah, I know. We're going to probably get some uniformity around the issue of sports betting now in the region because you are going to go to the polls on November 5th. You are going to vote for president, for U.S. Senate, for governor, and you are going to vote on whether or not to legalize sports betting in the state of Missouri. Now, I believe it's going to pass, and I believe it's going to pass pretty easily. I don't think this issue is Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. I believe that we're at a point now in 2024 where people are saying, hey, if you want to be able to place a sports wager, you should be able to do that. And by the way, if you don't, for whatever reason, if it does or if it conflicts with any values that you have, well, you know what? You can avoid it, just like having something to drink. That's how it's going to go. And frankly, that's how it should go in the state of Missouri. Missouri is losing out on millions of dollars that is going to Kansas and that is going to other surrounding states, Iowa, Illinois, and elsewhere that have legalized sports betting. So this got done with the initiative petition reform, and basically the teams got frustrated. Or backers of the teams, the pro sports teams in Missouri, the Chiefs, the Royals, the Cardinals, the Blues, they got sick of having to wait on the legislature, the do-nothing legislature in Missouri, that was basically not getting a sports betting bill done. There were a couple of people in particular, Denny Hoskins, who's likely to be the next secretary of state. And, you know, I I like Denny, but I just thought he was dead wrong trying to hold up sports betting as a single issue here in Missouri. So uh, basically, backers of the teams put together a big campaign to get the signatures they needed to get this on the ballot. To set this up, I was looking it up this morning. You need somewhere around 170,000 signatures from around the state, and you need somewhere around 25, 30,000 per congressional district in the state of Missouri to get something on the ballot for an initiative petition. It's a fairly low barrier in Missouri. That's why when you heard the politicians in Jeff City talk about IP reform, which always drove me nuts, talk like a normal person. No one knows what your acronyms mean. Initiative petition reform, they always call it IP reform, though. That was about increasing the threshold to how many votes you would need to get something on a statewide ballot. Make it more difficult, John. Which will lead to something I would interject later. I don't want to derail the conversation, but being a Missouri voter and facing this, hey, it's on the ballot again thing. I will uh, will, uh, detail that further. My thoughts on that once you're done. Yeah, no, it's 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 something seems like a ping pong thing. could start to happen if the threshold remains low. Yes. And it will remain low because the legislature, as I understand, didn't really do anything about it. So basically, you can get big money interests running around the state, collecting signatures and getting things on the ballot. In the case of sports betting, you know, I don't really have an issue with it, obviously, at all. I have placed a sports bet or two in my day. But then you get to these other issues, the other things that are going to be on the ballot now in November in Missouri. One is going to be abortion. Of course, Missouri, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, has been one of the stricter states when it comes to abortion because now abortion is a statewide issue. So you have abortion groups, Planned Parenthood and others, who spend big money to go around the state and collect signatures so they could go back to committing crimes, in my opinion, and acts of evil at will, more freely. That's now what they are trying to achieve in the state of Missouri. And by the way, they may very well get their way. When abortion's been on the ballot in these states, whether it's Kansas, whether it's Ohio, it doesn't matter how blue or red the state is, the abortion issue usually passes. So now that's going to be on the ballot as well in November. And then there's the issue of the minimum wage. Now, the minimum wage has gone up the last couple of years in Missouri. This is the part where I sit here and I'm like, okay, 
Like, mm-hmm. this has been taken care of. The mm-hmm. legislature has done this. But, obviously, there are groups who want to keep making sure the minimum wage goes up and the small business owner be damned, whether you're in Kansas City or Holt County, we're going to treat everybody the same. The sick pay thing, I think, is the uh, maybe new wrinkle. Yes. Intended to get people out. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if approved, if that ballot initiative was approved, the minimum wage would go to $13.75 an hour on January 1st. Right now, it is $12.30 an hour. So it actually just went up to 12 bucks an hour on January 1, and the current rate is, uh, excuse me, $12 an hour was the start of 23. The current rate is 12.30 an hour because of a cost of living adjustment that was applied this year on January 1st. So if that's approved, minimum wage would go to 13.75 an hour on January 1 and then $15 an hour on January 1 of 2026. After that, it would be indexed for inflation. So that minimum wage issue is also on the ballot. So this is now something, and then, of course, the paid sick leave, as John noted, is part of that as well. So now you've got these three issues that are going to be voted on by you. And all it has to get is 50% plus one to become law. Sports betting, bringing back very loose abortion laws to the state of Missouri, which was funded in large part by Planned Parenthood, and then the minimum wage increases. So two of those are very much staunch liberal issues, right? Certainly minimum wage. They just, you know, if only we paid everybody $50 an hour, life would be great. (laughs) Yeah, until like, you know, milk costs you $52, then you'd be complaining. And then, of course, we know the abortion issue is something that is going to get a lot of attention as well. Now, do I think this is going to change the outcome of statewide elections for people like Mike Kehoe and Josh Hawley? No. Republicans are still going to win these races. Could they end up being closer than they otherwise might be? With things like abortion on the ballot, yes. But here's the thing. If you are somebody who is, like, really driven a vote based on abortion, well, you are going to vote anyway. Like, you are going to go to the polls and vote for Kamala Harris. So I don't know who would be out there to vote who is not already going to run to the polls for Kamala Harris in Missouri, and she's not going to win Missouri, who now is like, you know, I wasn't going to vote for Kamala. I wasn't going to vote at all. But now because abortion's on the ballot, I'm going to go run and vote and theoretically help Democrats up and down the ballot. I don't see it playing a big role in any of the statewide races in Missouri. I don't see it impacting, obviously, the presidential race between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. I just don't see any of that happening here. It might be a little closer by a couple of points, but it's not going to change the outcome between Republicans and Democrats statewide in Missouri. 913-408-7957 as we get it rolling at 613 on KCMO Talk Radio. So if you are Missourian, get ready to go to the polls on that front. In the meantime, who may be Nostradamus in the political environment right now? We'll tell you who coming up next. See, this is just not true on the text line, 913-408-7957. Pete, arguments for sports betting and gambling are no different than hard drugs. No, that's not true at all. There's no benefit to hard drugs, right? You can't do hard drugs casually, but you can have a glass of wine at dinner without being an alcoholic. You can place a $2 bet on Mark's week one NFL parlay and not have a gambling addiction. You can't do hard drugs without having, you know, basically serious societal issues. There's nothing you can do on the hard drunk front that is casual. So that's where this sports betting issue that is now going to be in the ballot in Missouri on November 5 is different. Can you do the thing that is legal and not have a problem? Can it be something that is just enjoyed as part of a society that maybe you don't agree with, but doesn't cause any chaos or destruction societally? Can you do it responsibly? If the answer is yes, then I speak broadly here when I say this, I'm okay with those things being legal. Just because it has the potential of being abused 
doesn't mean it shouldn't be legal. Just because some people do things irresponsibly doesn't mean it shouldn't be legal. Should driving vehicles be illegal because some people are going to drink and drive? No. Why punish the masses because of a handful of bad decisions? That doesn't make any sense. Mike's in Kansas City. He's on KCMO. What's up, Mike? Good morning. Yeah, you know, you're talking about abortion being a liberal issue. Uh, It really isn't. And I think uh, Trump is probably right on target where where the country feels about abortion. And, you know, making it a state issue, I think, is the right way to go. And you're going to find a lot of people in Missouri that are going to be voting for Trump and for Holly and for all the conservatives. They're also going to be voting uh, to uh, liberalize the abortion laws. Uh, The only reason why Laura Kelly got reelected when the abortion question was on the ballot was because of Gomer Pyle. You factor out the Gomer Pyle votes, and we don't have a Republican governor right now. Uh, This issue is really misread by a lot of people who really aren't on the ground and seeing what's going on. uh, Here's what I'll say, though. Trump Trump hasn't really – Trump has basically said the abortion issue is now handled by the states, right? I mean, that's that's been his big thing. He hasn't really come out with any kind of – you know, timeline or restriction on abortion. He's really stayed out of the whole deal. Actually, he said things along the line of, uh, what is it, uh, 16 weeks or 36 weeks, or what, uh, not 36 weeks, whatever it was, the common thing that most people in the country agree to. Yeah. The first trimester. I mean, he, yes, he's he floated it. On that. He's floated it out there, but he's never been like, you know, he's never given some hard policy position on it. No, but he's also never said that he wants to outlaw abortion completely, like uh, Harris and you know Rachel Madcow and all the other crazies are alleging he's saying. Yeah, correct. He hasn't done that either. Yes. He's, he's quite liberal, if you want to call it liberal, uh, on abortion. And again, I agree that the thing should go back to the people, you know, when ultimately any decision made in, in the country should go back to the people. And, you know, this as a referendum, this this is great. But, you know, the liberals want to make abortion a liberal issue just to get the women. So you have a woman that may be sympathetic to Trump, then they can go to her and say, aha, he's going to outlaw abortion, so you got to vote, you know, liberal. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the ones that are trying to categorize it. But trust me, people on the ground, people, everyday working people, there are a lot more people that like to see at least first trimester abortion for a variety of reasons. It's not a liberal and conservative issue, you know, as, as they try to paint it. It's it's not. I mean, that's that's a it's a fair point, Mike. It's not as liberal and conservative as many issues are that you're you're right about that. I will give you that there is more of a gray area with that issue because it's obviously a very complex issue. It's a very hot topic. I'll give you that. I mean, you're right to an extent. Um, But still, we saw what happened in Kansas when that value them both ballot issue was voted on in August of twenty two. And those who are in favor of abortion got a massive win statewide. It was, what, a 20-point blowout victory, give or take? Now, a couple of things there that will not apply to Missouri. One, the people that are going to go vote in November 5 during a presidential election are going to go vote anyway. In August of 22, primary day, midterm year, you have to get people energized to the polls. Republicans thought in 22... They would be more energized because they had primaries and Democrat primaries in Kansas usually are meaningless. But obviously that issue got a lot of people juiced up on the other side. And on top of that, it was the first vote anywhere in the country after Roe got overturned. So the timing was just horrible. Mike is also right to point out that Republicans would have still won the governor's race in November of that year. Had Dennis Gomer Pyle not run as an independent and taken about 20,000 votes from Derek Schmidt. And obviously that was more or less the difference in that race. And by the way, I probably haven't celebrated enough the fact that Gomer Pyle up there in northeast Kansas uh, lost his primary last week. We mentioned it on the show the day after, but it was pretty big news. So... How about that? Gomer is out. Although I kind of like the whole Gomer Pyle nickname thing that we had going for him. He was in the state Senate for the last bunch of years in Kansas. All right. Nostradamus. Maybe we should call her Nikki Damas. This clip started resurfacing last night. And it's not to sit here and say, wow, Nikki Haley should have been the nominee. That's please do not read that into what I'm saying. I just thought it was interesting because it went viral last night. That uh, 
Nikki Haley, back in February on CNN, said this. The party that gets rid of their 80-year-old candidate is the party that will win. There will be a female president of the United States. It will either be me or it will be Kamala Harris. If Republicans nominate Donald Trump, it will be Kamala Harris. That was Nikki Haley on CNN back in February. Now, Donald Trump's still in a position where he absolutely can win this race. Have things tightened up since Joe dropped out and Kamala came into the mix? Absolutely. Is the media helping her? No doubt about it. All those things are true. But that is an awfully interesting statement from Nikki Haley back in February. Predicting that if Trump gets the nomination, well, they're going to blow out Joe and put Kamala in there. Now, no one could have projected how this was going to play out the last six weeks with the disastrous debate, the near assassination of Donald Trump. Nobody would have projected or predicted that. But she was right in terms of understanding how the matchup was going to go and maybe knowing a little bit behind the scenes on what the Democrats were thinking and how they would play their base up and play the media like a fiddle to make Kamala come off moderate and appealing to swing voters, which she frankly should not be, but they protected her in three and a half weeks, so they're getting what they want. But Nikki Haley saying what she said there, that's quite a bit of foresight, considering that's exactly how it's playing out right now. The polls have tightened up tremendously, and as we sit here right now on August 14th, the whole thing's a coin flip. Go figure. Now, coming up on KCMO Talk Radio, a major labor organization has filed a suit against Donald Trump. Be careful what you wish for with big labor. And I want to hear from you, UAW and union folks, on this story coming up next on 95.7 FM, KCMO. That's why you got to be careful with some of these um, big labor groups. No, not you, the working stiff. Not you, the union worker. I mean your mafia bosses. That's who I'm talking about here. So Donald Trump and Elon Musk do this X space a couple of nights ago. And... They veered off into the conversation of unionized workers, workers going on strike. Uh, It is well known right now that the UAW, United Auto Workers Union, is trying to unionize and organize Tesla workers. So that came up and the UAW flagged this comment from Donald Trump to Elon Musk two nights ago. And, and, I, and I'd, I'd be happy to help out on such a commission. I'd if, love it. If it were fun. Well, you, you're the greatest cutter. I mean, I look at what you do. You walk in and you just say, you want to quit? <laughs> they go yeah. on strike. They, I won't mention the name of the company, but they go on strike and you say, that's okay. You're all gone. You're all gone. So every one of you is gone and you are the greatest. You would be very good. Oh, you would love it. But, you know, if you look at Argent. Well, I'd be happy yeah, to help By the out. way, congratulations. Yeah. I just looked at the number of people. And, and I- so that was... The thing that got the United Auto Workers Union political honchos all bent out of shape. They said they filed charges against Trump and Musk for, quote, their illegal attempts to threaten and intimidate workers who stand up for themselves by engaging in protected concerted activities such as strikes. That was the complaint filed by the United Auto Workers Union political leaders yesterday. Oh, these people are exhausting. (laughs) Not you, the worker. Let's be very clear. Not you going to Clay Como, Fairfax, anything like that. We, the willing, led by the unknowing. Yada, yada, yada. Now, the UAW recently endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris's 2024 bid. So, by the way, Kamala Harris would love to see all of you working on the F-150s out of work. She's been all about green energy, green this, EV this, EV that. That's been a big part of her political career since she stepped onto the national stage back in 2019. But, of course, leadership in these unions can't help themselves. So now, you know, if you're a UAW worker, I know that many of you are uh, probably at the office by now, but maybe you're just getting in. 
to go to work or you're someone who has, you know, UAW experience or background. 913-408-7957. When you see stories like this, when your leadership gets overtly political like this, filing these complaints and flagging comments in an hour-long speech or hour-long conversation between Elon Musk and Donald Trump. Are you going to sit there and take it? Or is it time to start making sure that these union leaders actually represent you, actually represent the people? Because that's not happening. And it has not been happening for a long time. Sean Fain is the guy who was the head of the UAW, United Auto Workers Union. And remember, they were on strike last year. And Sean Fain, my goodness, this guy couldn't help himself at the time. He made it all about politics. Even though he admitted in January in this clip I'm going to play here for you, that he knows the union members, you, the UAW workers, are not on the same page as leadership. Look, let me be clear about this. (laughs) A great majority of our members will not vote for President Biden. Uh, Yes, some will. Uh, But that's the reality of this. Uh, The majority of our members are going to vote their paycheck. That's right. That was Sean Fain back in January talking about Joe Biden and how many of his own members are not going to vote for the Democrat. But yesterday, Sean Fain said in a statement, both Donald Trump and Elon Musk want working class people to sit down and shut up and they laugh about it openly. It's disgusting, illegal, and totally predictable from these two clowns. If you're a UAW member and you are paying a pretty penny to be a union worker and the face of your union, Sean Fain, is calling the guy who you are going to vote for in November a clown and there's no repercussions... How does that make you feel? When they know full well, there's a large percentage of you. I don't know about a majority, but a large percentage of just run-of-the-mill UAW members who will be voting for Donald Trump in November. 913-408-7957. And you don't have to take my word for it. This is Frank Luntz political consultant, pollster, the guy who wears the fake wig whenever he goes on TV. He's got like a gray beard and he's got like red hair at 55, 60 years old. So Frank Luntz with his wig goes on CNN last night and talked about the issue of union membership and how union membership is very much disconnected from where its leadership is at when it comes to political endorsements. But I assure you that Donald Trump is doing better among the average union member, not teachers unions, And not the unions for government, but everybody else, the trades, the people working their hands. He's doing better among them than any Republican has done in decades. This is not going to be a problem for him. The union leadership is more divided from their membership. And the louder that it gets, the greater the divides are going to come. And in my focus groups, and this is remarkable to me, the union membership says they don't speak for me. And I've been doing this now since 19... I hate to say this, 89, 1990, I've never had union people publicly say they don't speak for me. So that was Frank Luntz on CNN last night on this very issue. And since the UAW filed these labor charges against Donald Trump and Elon Musk, uh, the Trump campaign has called it a frivolous lawsuit and a shameless political stunt intended to erode President Trump's overwhelming support among America's workers. That's what they're calling it. And they're probably right to do that. But it's important to note that Sean Fain, the head of the UAW and the UAW at the leadership level, has endorsed Kamala Harris's 2024 bid. And now they are doing the bidding of the Harris campaign by bringing attention to this off the cuff comment by Donald Trump when talking to Elon Musk and implying that Donald Trump is against the working man and woman in this country. That's the goal here. On the text line, Pete, you are putting way too much emphasis on the Elon chat and want it to mean more than, than it does. No, I, I, I don't actually believe it will move the needle all that much. It's the UAW that is super focused on this. 
It's the UAW that is trying to turn this into more than it really is. That's the UAW. I didn't even hear this. I mean, I listened to probably 20 minutes of Trump and Elon the other night when they did this interview. I didn't hear this comment. Or if I did, I just kind of went in one ear and out the other. It's the UAW that's trying to help Kamala Harris by turning this one off-the-cuff comment into this huge deal, which it really isn't. But they want to make it into that. Right. They want to check it into the echo chamber that is the national media. Yes. So it gets its play. Yes. Trump and Elon against the little guy. You know who's against the little guy? Mm -hmm. The administration that sent the cost of everything up 15, 20 percent the last three and a half years. Because they spent like a bunch of drunken sailors. They're the ones against the little guy here. Let's be very clear. Because inflation hurts the little guy far more than it hurts the big guy. The big guy with a couple of mansions, the billionaires, as they like to rail on, you know, they can afford the cost of eggs going up a dollar. The little guy can't. 913-408-7957. 913-408-7957. So what you've got here, if you're a Fairfax worker, if you're up at the Clay Como plant, or if you're just in any union at all, I think what you're going to see here over the next few months is leadership and members continuing to split on what's best for the country going forward. 913-408-7957. So Sean Fain doing what Sean Fain has done since last year, which is why I was always sympathetic to the workers, but I had zero sympathy whatsoever for leadership at the national level. In these union shops, Pete Mundo on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM and streaming on the KCMO Talk Radio app. It's just so lame. If you're an auto worker, you've got to see through this, right? What Sean Fain's doing to try to politicize an off the cuff comment from Donald Trump and Elon Musk. UAW filing these lame labor charges against Trump and Musk for comments they made on their X space the other night. When Trump said, quote, you walk in, you say you want to quit, they go on strike. I won't mention the name of the company, but they go on strike and you say, that's okay. You're all gone. You're all gone. So every one of you is gone. And this comes as the UAW is also aiming to organize Tesla workers. And by the way, the UAW has also endorsed Kamala Harris. So it's very clear what they're doing here. And if you're a UAW member, your dues are being used to try to get Kamala Harris elected, despite the fact that a vast majority of UAW workers are going to go vote for Donald Trump. Paul's in Kansas City. What's up, Paul? You're on KCMO. Hey, Pete, kind of on the same lines there. I was uh, kind of a myth when the uh, European Union, those globalists in Brussels, uh, Belgium, at the Hague, sent a warning letter to Musk about his conversation with Trump. This is the second threat from Europeans to Americans. The uh, Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, and the mayor of uh, London, Shere Khan, that if you post anything on social media about our immigration protests, no matter where you're at in the world, we're going to throw you in the Tower of London. Okay. Try and go down to South Georgia and get some American and try and extradite it back to England. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, man. That's a great point. Unbelievable, Paul. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. 913-408-7957. That's the uh, studio line. And, of course, the text line here on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM. We are always streaming all morning long. On the KCMO Talk Radio app, Pete, UAW members are unable to vote in a normal poll. They got to go through the UAW designated poll where Rocco and Biff are running things. I don't know. (laughs) I'm pretty sure they go to the regular polls. But yes, there's obviously plenty of alleged over the years corruption that can go on when it comes to union memberships and voters and strong-arming people and the whole deal. So, yes, all that is very much true and part of the conversation. Now, speaking of Elon Musk and electric vehicles, did you see this here locally in Kansas City? Let's go to Merriam, where it is now illegal to park at an EV charging station without plugging in to charge a vehicle in Merriam. This was passed by the city council this week. The new law prohibits anyone from blocking or parking in spots designated for EVs unless the vehicle is actively charging. The ordinance applies to EV charging stations on both public and private property and will be handled much like the enforcement of handicapped parking spaces, according to Ryan Dinks, 
the Merriam City Attorney. Is there a better name for a city attorney than I Ryan see, Dinks? I see what you did there. I don't know. It just It's a perfect name for a guy who apparently now is interested in going around the city and being like, oh, is that a car in an EV charging station that's not charging? Mr. Dinks is on it. This is the lamest city mm-hmm. ordinance ever. First yeah. off, I don't know about Merriam. I can't speak to I mean, you know, I don't spend a lot of time in Merriam. But where I live, I go to my high V and there's a dozen EV charging stations. If one or two are in use, it's like, oh, wow, someone's actually charging their EV and sitting there for a half hour while I'll go, you know, fill up my gas tank two minutes down the road and be in and out and be going on with my life for the day. I've never seen, at least where I live, all electric vehicle charging stations in use at one time, at least in the local high V parking lot, John. I don't know about you. What do we got a half a dozen outside your window there? Yeah. I think. Yes. I've seen two people at once on that. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Okay. Now well, I did have trouble getting my toast to brown there in the oven down in the <laughs> kitchen. It took two cycles, so maybe it's <laughs> pulling some juice when you get two people on it at once. Well, you got a better view at these EV charging stations yeah, cool. than I do. You've got the foliage. Yeah, exactly. I've got trees in the way here, but you guys see them. So you've only seen two of yeah, six. Yeah, when I leave filled. around noon, you know, somebody okay. will plug in. Ah, right. Okay. And their lunch break probably or something. Yeah, they're trying to just get out of their meeting. That's what they're trying to do. Got to go charge up the EV. Now, I've seen a guy with an electric car park there but not be plugged in. So what's that? Ah, you know. Hmm. How can you prove something? And that's the other part of unintended consequences. I got a Tesla. I parked in here. I'm going to do it when I get back or whatever. I don't know. Or I just came out and unhooked it. I yeah. guess now do you have to move? Is is that going to be the deal? Well, and, and by the way, who's going to be in charge of this nonsense? Exactly. I mean, come on. You're going to have the Merriam police now driving around being like, ah, oh, man, you know, we should probably start to pull people over who are going 20 miles over the speed limit. But nah, it's a lot easier to bust people who have their... Car is in an EV charging station and they aren't actively charging it. Goodness gracious. Well, it sounds like a six figure gig to me. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> the way we do things. We used to work over in Miriam. I, so they've got the DMV, the High V, the Target. I think that's where they're all kind of centrally located. But how many more charging stations are they trying to get people like the shop not to park in there? Is that basically it? Well, I, that's what I wonder. I mean, if you have people with gas powered cars who are then charging an EV parking stations and that's somehow problematic in Merriam different conversation I suppose but while I haven't noticed this specifically in Merriam there's plenty of places we all go now where there are EV charging stations and I can't think of a time when I've seen gas powered cars just using the EV charging stations as parking spots because by the way usually the EV charging stations at least in the big box stores and parking lots are not close parking spaces. They're in the back of the parking lot. And that makes sense because if they were close, you would have people abusing that, right? They'd put their car there. They'd get a closer parking spot. They'd walk into their Walmart, their Target, their mm-hmm. Hy-Vee. Yeah. But they're usually in the back of the parking lot. So I don't know who it is that's even abusing any of this. You know what it feels like to me? It feels like a made-up deal where they want to act like there's a lot of enthusiasm for electric vehicles in Merriam. So they're like, yeah, we're going to create this new ordinance that's going to make it seem like everyone wants their EV charging station, and then they want it now when there's actually no demand for it. Right. I was thinking it was Merriam, so I guess they're going to have to enforce that on both of their charging stations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. How many, how many would do they have, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the next thing. Yes. How much of a revenue generator do we have here? Yes. On the text line, Pete, this is a courtesy and respect for people who drive EVs. I'm a Republican. I drive a Tesla. And there's been many times when people have parked in the EV parking because they want to park closer. Now, that's what we were just talking about, though. I don't know what stores have their EV parking closer than just regular spots. I have not seen that. I'm happy to be proven wrong on that, but I haven't seen it. And by the way, enforcement on this is going to be very difficult. Very difficult. Let's be honest. It feels good, but it's going to be really difficult. I got everybody and their mother now bothering me to get the invite to the J.D. Vance fundraiser coming up in uh, Mission Hills. It's going to be next Thursday night. I mean, gosh, I haven't been treated this well in a long time, John. Everybody wants the invite now. Maybe we should hit the promotions department and say, (laughs) 
Pete went to meet J.D. Vance, and all I got was this T-shirt. <laughs> and we could print a bunch of those up. That could be as close as you could get, maybe. Maybe. That, yeah. <laughs> it might be more likely that you meet J.D. Vance than we get money for T-shirts. Well, though. that's right. a great right. point. You're right about that, which is a whole other slew of issues. But <laughs> J.D. is coming to uh, Mission Hills next week. He's doing a fundraiser, and it's going to be with Mike Pompeo. Of course, former Kansas congressman and then secretary of state under Donald Trump. Senator Roger Marshall here in Kansas and Senator Mark Wayne Mullen from Oklahoma. So it's next Thursday. You can get in for $5,000 a couple. So the cool price of five grand a couple. If you want the photo op, though, with J.D., it's going to cost you 10 grand. Whoa. Yeah, 10 grand a photo. You got change for a 20. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be part of the round table, which is a round table photo op in the reception, 25 grand a couple. Now we're talking real money around here, okay? 25 grand a couple. Do we also get a photo of George Brett? Or? <laughs> um, yeah, d- nothing about George Brett okay. in the RSVP I'm looking at here. People sent me the invite like I was going to be dropping 50 grand or 25 grand on this thing. <laughs> Uh, and you then just if, spent money on school supplies. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you want to be on the host committee, that's $50,000 a couple. All right? That's the uh, cream of the crop right there. Fifty grand a couple, host committee, round table, photo op, and the reception. So that's the top tier $50,000 per couple to hang out with uh, J.D. Vance. Can you at least get a signed copy of Hillbilly Elegy with that? I mean, is that too much to ask for? What do you think? I don't think it should be. They got to include a little something, a little extra juice in there. I agree. Uh, come on now. Got to give us something. Get a little something. I, I mean, don't know. The photo's all right. The but... photo's okay. You know, but I need a little more than just the photo. But anyway, that's going to be coming up next week. So uh, the location, by the way, has not been publicized for obvious reasons. This is J.D.'s first stop in Kansas since being selected as Donald Trump's running mate. He did a fundraiser in St. Louis back on July 26th. That's been his only stop in Missouri since the GOP convention. So, listen, it's the name of the game. We all know how it works when it comes to raising money in politics. And both sides have a lot of big money donors that they need to help them win the election. That's a fact. Anybody telling you that either party is, I mean, listen, I think one party's policies obviously help the little guy far more than the other sides do. But this notion that, you know, and I've seen some of this from Kamala Harris and uh, Timmy Tim there, Tim Waltz, talking about how Republicans are funded by big money donors. It's like, stop. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Are you freaking kidding me with that? You've got everyone in Hollywood, all the elites in the media who are totally backing you as you do fundraisers from Los Angeles to New York down to D.C. Spare me the whole you're fighting for the little guy nonsense, okay? When was the last time somebody said to George Soros, put your pennies away, kid, you're breaking my heart, right? (laughs) That's exactly right. So, you know, um, that's happening next week. And if you got the cash and you want to help J.D. and Trump get elected, well, guess what? Um, Next Thursday... If you trust me, if you want to spend 50 grand, I'll make sure you find the right people. Okay. If you want to dish out that dough, we'll get you in touch with the right folks here on KCMO. Now, speaking of JD Vance, have you seen this? This is from the Daily Beast, which is, uh, you know, kind of like Vanity Fair. It's just a far left blog at this point. Second photo alleged to show JD Vance in drag posted online. The Vance campaign has not denied that the man in drag in a viral photo was Donald Trump's 2024 presidential election running mate. A second image of J.D. Vance allegedly dressed as a woman in a blonde wig has been posted on X, formerly known as Twitter. The post reads simply, a second photo has hit my inbox. It appears to show a man in drag wearing the same wig and costume as in an earlier image said to have been snapped by a Yale classmate of J.D.'s back in 2012. A spokesperson for Donald Trump's running mate did not deny that the first photo posted on X was authentic when approached for comment by the Daily Beast. The second photo shows the subject looking down at the camera with hands behind their neck. 
It was posted on the same account as the first picture. Now, it looks like J.D. Vance, but this is not J.D. Vance dressing in drag. This looks like a guy dressed up for Halloween as Britney Spears or something like that. That's what this looks like. This is not actually somebody dressing up as a drag queen. This looks like somebody who dressed up as a joke to pretend to appear like a woman as a joke. I mean, he's still got his full beard. He's just got a blonde wig on. That's all you're seeing here in these photos, John. Well, I mean, he could have been headed to the library for story hour. <laughs> I don't know what the upset's about. Yeah, well, right. well, I'm thinking about it, too. I'm like, wait, you guys should love this. <laughs> right? You know, mm-hmm. suddenly we should have a lot of people saying, yeah, I might, might like that guy and vote for that guy, J.D. Vance. Ooh, ow, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you got to be kidding me with this stuff. It's clearly, and it looks like J.D., But it's clearly somebody dressed as a woman as a joke, not somebody, as John said, going down to the local library for story time, you know, drag queen hour. I have noticed, I think he does a little bit of the eye makeup, which is, I wonder if he's a My Chemical Romance fan. That's what (laughs) What is that? One of your old dopey emo bands? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, listen, (laughs) uh, we know what's gone on with that music in this town the last week or so. So maybe, you know, you can start your own little emo music podcast podcast. there, Mark, and see how that takes off. We'll take all the credit here on KCMO. Fine. Maybe he's an emo fan from 15, 20 years ago at this point. Did you ever wear the eye makeup, Mark? I did not, but I had friends that did. Oh, okay. Are you sure? We're the same age, me and JD. So We're not going to see some photos surface of you in eye makeup when you hit the big time? I I had the long hair, but not the makeup. Uh, uh, Tight jeans, but not the makeup. (laughs) Okay. So tight jeans, long hair, no makeup. So two out of three. Yeah, two out of three. All right. Two <laughs> Maybe out of three. A photo of myself from 1975, 76 in makeup, but it was all kiss <laughs> regalia. So <laughs> I can't claim that one. <laughs> well, luckily, that was pre social media there, mm-hmm. John. So, yeah. you know, any it's photos are acceptable. unlikely to surface as well. So you're safe for the most part, but you did out yourself. So that's okay. Um, just make sure there's, check yourself, Mark, okay? Because if we get the eye makeup, we may have some problems here. Yeah. And okay. Photoshop and AI can do weird well, stuff. Well, that's so. a great point as well. But this is, I mean, this is so pathetic. Like, I'm looking at this photo of J.D. Vance with a blonde wig. And it's clearly a dude just with a wig on. And the other side of me says, don't you guys love this? Shouldn't you now be like, you know, this guy J.D. is not so bad. He pretends to be a woman. We love people like that. Maybe he really is. Who knows? Maybe it was just a fan. We don't know what's what and who's who anymore. This is great. Love this. Unbelievable. But when the Daily Beast is going after you for this stuff, uh, you're probably right over the target. I'm just saying. Because that's what the Daily Beast does. They write here, it's the latest drama to involve the GOP vice presidential nominee. Drama? Are you guys just like making stuff drama? Now, I'm promising you this is not going to be the make or break thing that you think it is. And you're owning yourself, by the way, if you're insinuating when you're the Daily Beast that J.D. Vance dressing in drag is somehow a bad thing when you guys love this stuff and want to promote this stuff all over the country, including to little kids. Drama was yesterday's calendar word of the day. (laughs) Today is embroiled, so look for embroiled. (laughs) 913-408-7957. Nine one three four zero eight seven ninety five seven. Maybe JD will break out the wig when he's in Mission Hills next week. We'll see if it's real. Harris Faulkner of Fox News is going to be here at the bottom of the hour. We'll get the election updates from her on KCMO Talk Radio ninety five seven FM. We are streaming on the iHeart and TuneIn apps. On the text line, Pete, why don't you just have the fifth caller join you at the JD Vance fundraiser next week? Well, I I can't do that. I don't know who the fifth caller is going to be. You kidding me? I'm going to have John Anthony screen in seven fifth callers and then have to pick the best one and then interview all of them, too. I mean, I don't need to get arrested at this thing next week, John. Come on now. I don't know if Larry's got anything to wear. Right? <laughs> Larry could be number five. Yeah, Larry and Prairie Village. He would like that. Let's, let's take old Larry. We haven't heard from him in a few weeks anyway. So, uh, yeah, that's the thing I want to avoid here, by the way. Could you imagine? <laughs> you guys say over of the... Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. 
That's All just right. the rules of radio. It's like Murphy's Law. <laughs> Oh, right, man. Six o'clock news. Here's the uh, yeah. best serial killer, and he's wearing your station t-shirt. <laughs> you know, like, Great. What happened? Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, meantime, here in Kansas City, St. Anthony Catholic Church on Benton Boulevard. Headline story right now at KCTV 5. They said they are determined to right what vandals wronged. Worshippers arrived at St. Anthony Catholic Church on Benton Boulevard Sunday to find a mess. Vandals damaged the parish's prayer garden and beheaded and committed sacrilege to the Virgin Mary statue that stood outside the church. Members of the parish believe the vandalism happened at about 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. And there are some photos here on KCTV 5 shared by St. Anthony's Parish that show the extent of the damage. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty extensive. The church said in a statement, we are sad that someone came last night and vandalized the prayer garden and beheaded and committed sacrilege to the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The parish says there are plans to repair the damage and restore the prayer garden so the community can continue to enjoy it. You know, credit to KCTV5 for having this story and actually caring about stuff like this. It's amazing. I go to some of the other local media outlets like Woke 41, which bills itself as a voice for everyone, which, of course, excludes, you know, Christians and heterosexuals and white people and things like that. Um, But anyway, I don't see it on their site, which I find interesting because hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. They're not actually a voice for everyone. They're just pandering. Um, But KCTV5, to its credit, carried this. So proud of our TV partners for doing this story. And actually, it's their lead story this morning on KCTV 5. I'm just glad it wasn't like a statue or a mural honoring George Floyd, because then there'd be major uproar around this town. You know, Kansas City Star would have a lead editorial story about it today, making sure that people were, you know, imprisoned for this and treated like, uh, you know, January 6thers and and things of that nature. So thankfully, and I say this very much tongue-in-cheek, It was only a statue of the Virgin Mary that was beheaded because it was like, you know, something else. Oh, man, there'd be hell to pay in this town. You know that and I know that. In the meantime, this is happening tonight. This came to me from a listener on Facebook. She says here, this is um, Jane. She said, Pete, I wanted to pass this along concerning the outrageous crime in the Brookside neighborhood lately. Perhaps some news media attention will wake up prosecutors in City Hall. Well, trust me, there's not much that's waking up the prosecutor in this town. She's on her way out. And uh, City Hall is, for the most part, fairly feckless. There is a Waldo Brookside crime panel discussion happening tonight. 4.30 to 6, Curry Auditorium at Research Medical Center, Brookside Campus, 6675 Holmes Road, 4.30 to 6 tonight, says here, please join us for a night with members of KCPD Metro Patrol, Property Crimes Unit, the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office. Okay, so someone's going to be there. And Brookside Waldo Community Improvement District Managers to discuss ongoing crime issues facing Waldo and Brookside. Questions for the panel can be submitted in advance through the Google form link below. Questions for the panel can also be submitted to the day of the event at check-in. I'm going to share this on X and also on Facebook. I have not seen it posted or talked about anywhere else. I may be wrong about that. I just haven't seen it. And I'd love for you to share it, even if you're not a resident of Waldo or Brookside, because I just want this to get a tremendous amount of attention. And I want city leaders and the prosecutor's office to, to you know feel a little heat from you. And this is the way you do it. It's not just by like posting things on Facebook, but it's by making the community aware, having people show up in massive numbers and showing your police department, your prosecutor's office, and then by extension, your city council that you're fed up if you're in Waldo or Brookside, which is never going to get the attention, obviously, of some of the more high crime areas or some of the entertainment districts where there are issues. But you've got a lot of folks that are just, you know, regular working people, but also some very nice homes in these areas where you've got your largest asset worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and you've got crime growing in all these places right in your backyard. 
And if you're sick of it, well, you got to vote better. But you also need to make sure that your leaders know that you are fed up and that you're aware and you're paying attention and you've had enough. So that's happening tonight, 4.30 to 6, the Waldo Brookside Crime Panel Discussion. I'm in a couple of Facebook groups, especially for the Waldo area, and I see people all the time on there just posting about, oh, boy, this and that and this crime and that crime. And it's, it's petty stuff, but still, stuff that matters.